today on Missing Link. How does a polar expedition relate to an organ? What does an organ have in common with an elephant? What is it that links that great pachyderm with neurology? And where's the connection between our nervous system and the precious metal gold? There aren't any links? Oh yes there are, you just have to look really hard. Missing Link. The German research vessel, Polarstern, on its way to one of the world's least accessible regions, the Arctic Ocean. Its specially strengthened bow and powerful engine make the ship ideally suited for the two-month expedition. It will be the first time that a research ship has sailed all the way round the North Pole. Temperatures have been rising in this region since the 1960s. There are 47 scientists on board. They monitor the temperature and density of the water and analyze its salt content. The ratio of fresh water will reveal how much ice has already melted as a result of climate change. The latest measurements prove that the salt content has decreased. they discover another indication of global warming too. In the ground samples, there are scratch marks caused by kilometer-thick ice plates. In the distant past, the ice layer must have been much thicker than it is today. At the end of the expedition, the scientists will know a lot more about how quickly the ice is melting. Ashdown is an icebreaker, it can't simply follow the compass. The helicopter has to constantly check the route to ensure it's not blocked by pack ice. It's sometimes quicker to take the long way round. The helicopter pilots have to keep their wits about them too, because visibility can turn bad in a matter of minutes. And if it does, they see nothing but white. Last year, one of the helicopters crashed. Briefing the crew. The Paul Ashdown needs research permits from the countries whose waters it passes through. After all, many countries have vested interests in the North Pole. All the adjoining nations guard their 200 mile zones. What remains, the area close to the pole lies under meters of ice. But the ice is constantly changing its shape. At the outset of the Paul Ashton expedition, the Northwest Passage, which runs northwards of the American continent, was largely free of ice. The ship can travel at 13 knots, about 24 kilometers per hour. The navigation is based on satellite images and antiquated charts they're still lacking accurate depth data. The team of geologists is in search of an undersea mountain, an extinct volcano that's marked on all the charts. Nowadays, location devices are much more accurate. The scientists follow the echo sounder images. The echo sounder creates an image of the sediment structure on the sea floor. The mountain is down there somewhere. Such a huge object should be hard to miss. Up till now, only icebreakers have braved the seas in this region. The drifting ice in the Arctic Ocean can make the route impassable in just a few hours. This is due to the formation of pancake ice, thin crusts of ice that collect and grow to form flows, which makes the route to the pole increasingly difficult. One of the most magnificent buildings in Germany is the Frauenkirche in Dresden. It houses perhaps the most impressive organ of recent times. But what's the connection between the organ and a polar expedition? The organ is the king of instruments. No other instrument can fill a vast cathedral so well. People can be brought to tears or filled with awe by its sound. 
Perhaps not so respectfully as the way Jack Frost deals with the organ pipes. They're made of tin and can suffer from tin plague. Now, that's not a real sickness, but more of a physical phenomenon. At room temperature, tin is a soft metal, but under 13 Celsius, its crystalline structure becomes brittle. It's the reason that lots of organ pipes in winter have sung their last song. The same problem, but with a different order of dramatic impact, was experienced by polar researcher Robert Alcon Scott. The seams on the fuel canister he was using on his 1912 expedition to the South Pole were soldered with tin. When the temperature reached minus 40, the tin plague raged wild and the fuel was all lost to the snow. Scott and his men froze to death. With no fuel for heating, they had no chance. And chills run down our spines when we read Scott's last entry in his log. It read, send this diary to my wife. Wife had been crossed out and replaced by widow. One of the most modern church organs in Germany can be found in the historic Frauenkirche in Dresden. The church's architect was Georga Beer. He drew up the plans for this unique church almost 300 years ago. Such a bold structure had never been attempted anywhere in the world, and hardly anyone believed that it would stay standing. But Georga Beer fought for his masterpiece, and with endless patience and using every trick in the book, it was finally completed. His building stood firm for 200 years, until February 1945. Then the Allied bombs struck Dresden and Georg Bär's Frauenkirche was reduced to rubble. The reconstruction of the church began in 1994 and today it stands as it once did, as majestic as Georg Bär intended it. The church's sandstone dome graced Dresden's skyline for two centuries. It rose like a crown above the sea of Baroque and classical rooftops in the city. But then the war began, which was to lead to its destruction. This footage shows the final concert performed in the Frauenkirche, the last time the organ was ever heard on the 17th of December 1944. Two months later, the Allies dropped more than 2,600 tons of explosives and firebombs on the city. The firestorm raised Dresden to the ground. Barely a stone was left standing. 80% of the city center was destroyed. The Frauenkirche collapsed the day after the devastating fire. At the end of the war, 30 million tons of rubble had to be disposed of. But miraculously, the debris from the Frauenkirche didn't get carried off with the rest of the rubble during the cleanup of the city. And during the building of the socialist state in the GDR, there were several plans to use the stones and masonry. But the ruins remained untouched, a memorial against war and destruction. A 70 meter square pile of rubble of 17 meters in height was all that remained of the monumental structure. In 1990, 45 years after the end of the war and the year of German reunification, the residents of Dresden launched a campaign to rebuild the Frauenkirche. They hoped this unique structure would regain its position among the world's great architecture. No other building in the world possessed a dome of this size, with such a steeply angled form and made completely of stone. With the help of donations from all over the world, the reconstruction was completed in 2005, and with it, a magnificent new organ was inaugurated. Today, the sandstone dome once again rises gloriously above the Dresden skyline, just as Georg Bär would have wanted it. Nairobi National Park is an orphanage for elephants. 
Many of the young animals here have lost their parents and herds to poachers. But how are elephants connected to church organs? Elephants are herd animals, but a herd can only function when all the members can communicate with each other. Elephants can do just that, and they do it in a remarkable way. They use infrasound. Infrasound is sound that is so low in pitch that we humans can't hear it. Our ears work in the range from 18,000 hertz to about 20 hertz. Anything lower just doesn't register with us. But really enormous organ pipes can also emit infrasound. And scientific research has shown that in humans, it can produce fear and awe. While it's not perceived at a conscious level, it induces the impression that something supernatural is happening. Which is appropriate, really, as organs are often to be found in churches where inspiring belief and showing great might is just what's needed. However, the degree of inspiration a human might receive from eavesdropping on a couple of elephants chatting away at a waterhole has not yet been thoroughly researched. It's early in the morning. 14 baby elephants are heading for Nairobi National Park, their kindergarten, where they'll learn all about life in the wild. None of them are older than two years, and all have lost their families. All they have is each other and their human guardians. Without their devoted care, these little dumbos wouldn't be able to survive. They need 24-hour care, you see. That's, uh, that's how they can be happy and they can grow well without more stress and traumatic things. You see, most of these ones, when they came in, they were in a very bad shape because some of them witnessed their mothers, the families being killed, you see, by poachers. But for a baby like Saitis, you see, she was so young to know what happened to her mother, so... For her, she didn't know what went wrong. She just, she just missed her mother. The female calf is just five months old. She was found beside her dead mother in Savo National Park. Saitis survived the attack by the poachers and was brought to the elephant orphanage. She's been in the care of the keepers ever since. Her new home is at Nairobi National Park in Kenya. It's the oldest national park in this East African country and lies just a few kilometers from the capital city. For over 30 years, the orphanage has been caring for baby elephants and preparing them for life in the wild. The biggest challenge at the start was to find a suitable milk substitute. The breakthrough came in 1987 when they developed a mixture that the elephants could digest better than cow's milk and which tasted good too. You cannot feed elephants on cow's milk because cow's milk has got lots of fats and elephants are poor in fat digestion. If you feed them on cow's milk, they eat diarrhea to death. So that is why we're feeding them on this formula, which is a vegetable-based formula. It is a soya-based, normal formula that is fed on human babies. The young elephants drink up to 40 liters of milk a day, and the keepers have to feed them every three hours. The babies put on about a kilo in weight every day. Dame Daphne Sheldrick founded this unique elephant sanctuary. She was the first person ever to successfully bring up orphaned baby elephants. Since that time, this Kenyan-born Englishwoman has been campaigning on behalf of the elephants. This has been my life, so I enjoy it. And uh, I enjoy following their lives. There's a lot of sadness involved, of course. We don't always succeed 
you have to be very fond of them because they can read your heart and we lose a lot of them. So, you know, we, we do our best, but we don't always succeed. The babies have spent the whole day in the bush with their carers. They return together in the evening. Sites follows her carer. She'll spend the night with him. She's covered in a blanket to protect her from the cold. Babysitting Sites is much more than just a job for Abdi Bagata. It's like taking care of my own children, staying with her, so I have to make her happy. She has to be comfortable with my own thing. Without this intimacy with her carer, Sites would be stressed and could die. In the wild, elephant mothers or aunts always stay close to their calves. There's a long way to go before Sites can be released into the wild. But with Abdi's help, she'll make it one day. Neurologist Professor Zulai studies his patient's sleeping patterns. The recording of brain waves is indispensable in this line of work. But what's the link between neurology and elephants? Neurology is the study of the nervous system and the brain. And it's no lightweight study. Researchers need to understand the brain and exactly how it functions. It becomes almost philosophical. Can a system be so clever that it can comprehend itself? To come to the point, there's still a lot to do. Amongst which we need to know why some people can remember vocabulary better than others. The researchers have chosen a prime model to examine this. A model we could never forget to remember, the elephant. And in reality, their temporal lobes are remarkably pronounced. And this is where memories are stored. People blessed with good memory often also demonstrate larger temporal lobes. The phenomenal brain process of elephants has impressed many a renowned zoologist. One of them observed an elephant keeper who used to give his elephant small round sweets as a reward. These little bonbons look like pebbles. One day, the animal didn't do what its keeper wanted, and instead of sweeting, it got rocks. Four weeks later, the elephant struck back and spat that stone back in his keeper's face. Kept in its mouth, he'd been waiting for that moment. Let that be a testimony to the power of an elephant's brain. Sleep is something we all need. On average, we spend about a third of our lives asleep, but nobody knows exactly why. The explanations range from the regeneration of the brain and organs to the way we've adapted to food availability. After all, those who sleep don't eat. Some believe that our bodily systems reorganize themselves during sleep. According to this hypothesis, during sleep the brain digests our waking experiences. This state in which we barely move lasts for about eight hours. We don't eat, we don't drink, and we don't see anything. First of all, it's important to understand sleep a bit better. We can roughly divide people into long sleepers and short sleepers. Scientists define long sleepers as those who sleep nine hours or more. Short sleepers are people who spend less than six hours asleep. The duration of normal sleep is around seven to eight hours. Jürgen Zulai of Regensburg University analyzes sleep. By attaching electrodes to the heads of his test subjects, the neurologist is able to determine the various sleep phases or tell if they're sleeping at all. Further electrodes on the chin and eyes measure muscle tension and eye movement. Using this approach, scientists are able to draw up a kind of map of sleep, which can be clearly divided into different phases. First there's stage one, which is a state between being awake and sleeping. We recognize it due to the slow, rolling eye movements. 
The die chin muscles are usually tense, and the EEG shows quite high activity, almost like that of a waking EG state. Eine hohe, relativ hohe Aktivität. Stage 2 is quite similar, ist except das that ähnlich, the EEG nur, shows EEG slow waveforms, special patterns that are clearly recognizable, sehen, but it's Muster comparable to stage 1. In this phase, the brain is particularly insensitive to external stimuli. In fact, it blocks out unimportant information. It seems that our brains are actively sealing us off from the commotion of the outside world, at least when we're first falling asleep. As we gradually drift into full sleep, we enter new stages. Stage three is the first phase of deep sleep. It's characterized by long waves, so-called delta waves. The subject is now hard to wake up, the muscles are slightly tensed. Stage four is true deep sleep. It's almost impossible to wake us up. Using an EEG, an electroencephalography recording, we see the delta waves dominate. This is the main characteristic of the deep sleep phase. After deep sleep, we enter the so-called REM phase. Our muscles are almost totally relaxed except for the erratic movement of our eyes. Das Stadium REM unterscheidet sich REM von allen anderen Schlafstadien, all stages of sleep, so dass wir es auch meist paradoxer Schlafen nennen. Es entspricht the nämlich nicht dem Schlaf. Wir haben zum einen Firstly, sehr schnelle horizontale Augenbewegungen, daher auch der Name Rapid Eye Movement. Secondly, the wir haben are in überhaupt a totally keine Anspannung state, as we can see from the der Muskulatur, display. das erkennt man an einem Strich, the also der Betreffende ist, ist state of gelähmt, kann sich nicht And bewegen und was wir finden, ist eben eine hohe Anspannung im EEG, is der awake, Betreffende ist praktisch wach und er träumt ja auch in diesem Schlafstadium. Sigmund Freud was convinced that dreams are more than just hot air. But what exactly is the brain doing when we dream? Neurologists think that it hardwires the waking experiences that are of particular importance, so they can be accessed more quickly in the future. And it simulates situations and reactions that we wouldn't allow to happen in a conscious state. Two German geologists are searching for gold in the Pontic Mountains on the Turkish-Georgian border. They find the first grains of gold in the meltwater coming down from the mountains. But what does gold have to do with neurology? Toward gold funnels, two gold pinballs, according to the 18th century German poet Goethe. But it's a motto we could well use to describe society today. We might consider that health of mind and body is more important than a treasure of wealth and riches. Better to be poor and healthy than rich and sick. But on closer examination, gold might be able to provide both. Possessing gold improves your situation. Obvious, isn't it? But today, researchers and doctors agree that gold can also affect our health, something that Chinese medicine recognized thousands of years ago. The precise reason for its beneficial effect is not yet understood, but it is known to help in cases of rheumatism, tuberculosis and stress, as well as ridding us of negative thoughts. In 1885, tiny particles of gold were administered for drunkenness and gold therapy was claimed to raise IQ by 20%. Perhaps it would have been better for the bankers of recent times to have read a little history, taken a little therapy and suck on a bar of gold rather than speculating with it. On the road in search of gold. In the northeast of Turkey, close to the Georgian border, two German scientists from the Bergbau Museum in Bochum are searching for evidence of the ancient land of gold, the legendary kingdom of Kolchis. Andreas Hauptmann and his colleague Unzal Yalcin are convinced that the ancient Greek myth of the golden fleece in Kolchis in fact describes the origin of the gold prospecting. Just a few grains of gold would be enough to allow the scientists to analyze the gold's fingerprint. They apply tried and tested rules of gold prospecting. 
the chances are best in places where the water doesn't flow too quickly and where the heavy grains of gold washed down from the hills with the meltwater in spring can collect. Like here, behind a large boulder. Scientists separate the small stones from the sand using a sieve. This is the first stage of sorting. The remaining sand is washed over a kind of slide with a small mat to collect the gold flakes. This method was known to gold prospectors in antiquity. The myth of the golden fleece probably has its roots in this method of prospecting. The ancients used sheepskin as a gold trap because the tiny grains of gold would get caught in the woolly fleece. This method has been described in ancient texts too. Just a tiny amount of gold would be enough for the archaeometallurgists from Bochum to compare the composition of the river gold with ancient gold artifacts. The next step is to rinse out the map. The extracted residue is now transferred to the gold pan. The initial findings are disappointing. The scientists only find a shiny pyrite flake, commonly called fool's gold. A few wash cycles later, real gold. They are only tiny particles, since gold never occurs in a totally pure form, but enough to establish the gold's origin, to read its fingerprint. We measure a lot of the minor elements and we also measure the composition of the lead isotopes, not only from the gold, but from copper minerals. Und das wiederum gibt den modernen Bergleuten durchaus wertvolle Hinweise über die Genese der Lagerstätte und damit auch Hinweise darauf, wo sie vielleicht bohren können und wo sie nicht bohren sollten. Andreas Hauptmann checks his find with his colleagues at the Geological Institute of Frankfurt am Main University, which has state-of-the-art analysis equipment. Tiny gold particles are vaporized with a laser beam in a mass spectrometer. The resulting gas is analyzed and reveals the fingerprint of the river gold from the Pontic Mountains. It can later be compared with gold from ancient treasures. One thing's for sure, there's gold in the hills of Moorgul. But how much? That's the question. In any case, the myth of the golden fleece has become a little more plausible.